I recently was involved with a debate or discussion with a colleague of mine out of Saudi Arabia on female hair loss, and we have pretty diametrically opposed opinions or thoughts. And I think uh, the ICHRS, uh, International Society of Hair Restoration Sur Surgery, will actually be posting that soon. And I'll try to repost that, that discussion with my colleague uh, so you can sort of see two opposing views. But I want to talk a little bit about my philosophy of how I manage women in terms of hair loss because it's a big part of my practice. I don't just perform men. A large percentage of my patients are females. In fact, I would say about half of my consultations for hair loss are women, which is really rare and exceptional, I think, in the industry. And about a third of my transplants are in women. In fact, I just did one today for, for a lady from New York. So I do quite a few consultations, quite a few surgical procedures, and I actually treat quite a few women medically, because if you can understand, out of that 50% of my consults, so let's, take, let's say all my female patients I see, I manage them surgery with medicine, but the way that I do things is quite different. So I'm gonna sort of break down how I treat female patients medically, how I treat them surgically, how it differs from my colleague in Saudi Arabia, and also I would say the general population of uh, hair surgeons out there or even dermatologists in terms of how they manage female patients. So I'm gonna first talk about medicine. So with medical therapy for the vast majority of women, I actually do not do currently in 2024 a lot of minoxidil and finasteride and things like that. Now, of course, everyone knows finasteride is a teratogenic uh, drug. In other words, it can cause birth defects in a female that can give uh, birth, but it is uh, oftentimes very favorable in women who are postmenopausal in some studies that have shown, and I still do use it, and I'll talk to you about how I use it. That being said, biochemical therapies such as finasteride, minoxidil, spironolactone, things like that, are actually not on my radar for the most patients coming in. I find that women really don't need a lot of biochemical therapies and they cause a lot of side effects in women that are not as favorable, such as hair shedding, secondary hair growth, uh, other issues, hormonal, hormonal problems as well, that I'm usually not jumping toward it. Of course, uh, in, with a detailed history, I'm always looking to see if there are elements of the history that would be helpful. For example, a, a young woman aggressively shedding, maybe a thyroid case, it could be a low iron level from menstruation. Um, an older woman, maybe in their late 40s into the 50s and 60s, it could be the fact that they're going through menopause and there's a hormonal disruption. So that being said, I always encourage women to get a full hormonal profile to look for any, any kind of laboratory abnormalities. Hair loss in women is actually quite prevalent. I, I like this number, it's not entirely accurate, but it's an easy number to remember. 30% of women over 30 lose hair and 50% of women over 50 lose hair. It, in other words, it is a very common condition. It's not as, as rare as we think. And I have women coming to me with very early hair loss and that as a male, you may look at your wife or significant other and think, oh, why is she complaining of this? I'm totally bald and I can't even see what she's talking about. But women have this feeling of density issues. They, they, they usually tell me their ponytail when they tighten it, it feels like it's much thinner or they, can, they feel like they've lost half their hair. Um, and when other people look at them, they probably think, what the heck, you look great. Why are you even bothering? Why are you gonna go see Dr. Lamb? Why are you gonna see a doctor about this? It makes no sense. But I'm very sensitive to that. I totally understand that women have a different standard than men. They may be very thin or they could just be in the early process of it or they could be aggressively shedding hair and they still may wanna go see consultation. So if biochemical therapies are not my first line in terms of therapy, what do I prefer? So I usually prefer natural therapies. Natural therapies, oftentimes when people hear this, they think about a laser cap, a laser comb, and they think about Nutrafol or uh, vitamins. Currently, I don't put those in my first line defenses. I think they're still favorable. I think they still can be helpful but they are my second or third line natural therapies uh, in terms of improvement. So my first line therapies are going to be three things. One is Folliflow, which we'll talk about. I do have a COI, conflict of interest, in the sense that I did invent this product, and, but I do think it's amazing. 
uh, I wouldn't have just invented. I don't sell something I don't believe in. I, I really believe in this product. It was recently featured on Today by a dermatologist who recommended it. It's a product that I really, really believe is an amazing product, but it has its role and it has limitations, and I'll talk to you more about that. Second thing is something called hair stem. I'll talk to you a little about what that is, is involved with that. And then a third one is a Botox release for hair loss. So once a woman has ruled out different types of hormonal issues that could be stabilized, like a low thyroid or a very off estrogen testosterone balance or a high menstrual issue, um, high, high, high bleeding during menstrual cycle or uh, an autoimmune disorder that may be accounting for something. Uh, of, of course, there's also traumatic hair loss with, you know, especially in African American women, traction alopecia, hair loss in terms of um, issues of chemical styling, uh, you know, physical damage to the hair, as well as significant weight loss, you know, things like that. Um, then we start to look at how do we manage the condition right now. Of course, in more detailed history, which goes beyond the, the, the this video, which would just make this video too long. Uh, is what I sort of summarized briefly there, but that's part of my history taking when I when you come in. Uh, but I would actually say if you have if you lost a lot of weight, if you're on uh, like a GLP-1 agonist that may have caused some things, uh, those things could be a contributor factor. But let's take a look at um, these therapies that I'm 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 using. So uh, the final one I, I did not mention is a, is a Botox treatment that I, I invented. I'm in the process of patenting, so I'm, I don't want to go too much into the details of how I do that. Uh, it, I will, my patent will be there probably about a year from now, but I, I'm going to go through just basic concepts of how I treat women. So when I treat shedding, when women just have massive shedding, so I want to just delineate between shedding and sort of chronic hair loss. When people, when women are shedding, first of all, they're not a good surgical candidate because surgery to me is something that you'll put hair in there, you'll cause more shedding, and you, you may gain three hairs and lose three hairs, and you're gonna have a net difference. It is not a good situation to do a transplant and someone's shedding. Now, if someone's shedding in a minor way, or you've stabilized shedding and it's still shedding a little bit, you could do surgery, but we're gonna talk about that category separately in a moment. But in terms of medical therapy with my FollyFlow product, what is it? It's a shampoo, conditioner, and a spray. You can get it, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it in my office, and the most potent is my third portion of it, which is the conditioning serum, which is an easy spray. I use it every day as a 55-year-old. It's definitely thick in my hair. And it, the shampoo, conditioner, and the spray don't leave your hair weighted. They, there are no side effects to it. It's all natural. You can get it on Amazon. As I said, you can get it in my office. And even if you don't shampoo and condition every day, it still works. But the vast majority, about 80% of that result, comes from the third product, which is the conditioning serum. You use once or twice a day. And you just spray it into your scalp. <clears throat> I use it also to <coughs> um, stabilize hairs for surgery, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So the spray treatment and this uh, shampoo conditioner uh, can really quickly stop shedding. I, it doesn't work on everyone, but in about 90% of patients, it really shuts shedding in its tracks. <clears throat> and unlike minoxidil, which can cause a, an uptick in shedding before there is improvement, this really just stops the shedding. My uh, au pair at the time, it lives with us, all the Roombas were filled with hair and within a week they were clear. So somewhere between a day to six weeks, there should be significant reduction in shedding with this product. Folly Flow is F-O-L-L-I-F-L-O. Again, you can get on Amazon. And this product is very, very effective in the vast majority. It also helps to th grow hair. It makes the hair thicker and better. Now, when we're talking about men, especially young men, this is not what the core of this, the, the, the core of this video is, obviously, it's about women. But with men, young men, I definitely think it's not uh, enough. You need to have a biochemical block like finasteride minoxidil for men, especially if they're under 50. But for women, it's my go-to in terms of hair shedding and some growth. It's more powerful, in my opinion, toward the hair shedding side. It is also helpful to strengthen hair um, I had a, a recent testimonial of a woman that said that she's used it long enough, a few months now, where she's only doing it twice a week and it's still sustaining a result. So, but I can't guarantee that, obviously. I'd use it twice a day, but you can do it once a day. And to me, again, for shedding, it's my go-to, absolute go-to is my number one, minus looking at other factors, as I said, there, if you are having massive weight loss, protein malnutrition, fever, sickness, things like that, um, you want to make sure that you, you factor all those in to try to control that 
problem because that can be the contributing factor, obviously. So the second thing is hair stem. <clears throat> what hair stem basically is, it's a very high concentration, <clears throat> pardon me, of growth factors, plant-based growth factors that are infiltrated into the scalp that are, uh, that are much more potent than PRP. So you think of PRP, which stands for platelet-rich plasma, which is blood drawn from your body and then re-injected into the scalp. There are several deficits of PRP. The first is that it doesn't work that well. Second of all, it hurts a lot because there's not a lot of growth factors in your blood oftentimes. Even if you're an elite athlete, sometimes it's just not enough to make stimulate the growth. So with these plant-based growth factors, I have a much higher concentration. I have an amazing machine that actually pushes it through the scalp with no pain. And you do that once a month for three months, you usually maintain it every six months, unless there's a little bit of advancement, then you may have to tighten up the, the interval. But it's very easy, it takes 60 to 90 minutes to do it, my staff does it, not me but there's no pain, there's no recovery, oftentimes there's no shedding or anything that's to, to speak of, and the results are super quick where the growth can happen within one to three months, um, and then it's maintained pretty easily. So for hair growth, I would say my hair stem is more uh, potent than my folly flow, and for hair shedding, my folly flow is more potent than my, uh, than my hair stem. And that treatment is something really easy to tolerate, and, it, and the results are quite good. Again, not 100%, I would say 90% of my patients have quite a good response. There's some patients that just there's not a huge difference, and that can happen. The final one is this Botox treatment that I do that, again, I can't really disclose how I do it, but it, it's not injecting the scalp. Uh, and it does hurt a little bit, but I'm done in about one minute. And that works on both hair growth and hair shedding very quickly within days to weeks. Because there's a slight discomfort with it, and because my other treatment, in my opinion, works a little bit better toward hair growth, which is the hair stem, and my folly flow works a little bit better on the hair shedding, this one does pretty good on hair shedding, pretty good on hair growth. I usually use this as my backup treatment where I perform it if my hair stem and my uh, folly flow products are not quite strong enough, then I add this therapy into the equation. So. Is there a role for biochemical therapy? When do I use minoxidil, finasteride, spinolactone, and other therapies like that? So the answer is I use that in a, in a few incidences. So the first incidence is someone that is postmenopausal. Um, there may be their sex drive is low. They're on some kind of testosterone replacement, and I'm and I'm worried that with that high concentration of testosterone, and they're seeing maybe an acceleration of hair loss that they probably need to be on some kind of DHT blocker like finasteride. I may be more inclined to be using a finasteride with or without minoxidil in that situation. The, the second incidence where I'm doing it is when I see a androgenic type of hair loss, like a frontal temporal corner recession. Again, that occurs more in postmenopausal women, and oftentimes I'm still using the, the, the natural therapies first, but these biochemical therapies work very well as a second line of defense in women. I guess a third incidence would be someone that has just been on it and they said, look doc, I've gotten some decent results with it, I'm happy with it, I don't wanna stop doing it because stopping it will cause hair shedding, then they should just continue. Or if I've done the natural therapies and, and they may be a good candidate for surgery because everything is stable, but they say, Dr. Lamb, I just don't want surgery, then that could be a case where we decide to go and just add the biochemical therapies. What biochemical therapies work? So I don't really prescribe spironolactone. I give that over to a dermatologist because I don't check laboratory numbers and try to figure out if your potassium is good and everything. So I usually hand that over to a dermatologist. But if someone doesn't have a risk of a birth defect with finasteride, I may use it with minoxidil. I can do it orally or topically. I prefer if we go this route, especially going the topical route, I like to do what's called a hair genome test. The genome test is a test to buckle swab, and I get a result back within about 30 days, a very detailed report of your genetic sensitivity. About 50% of individuals have a natural resistance to topical minoxidil. They don't have what's called inactive sulfa transferase enzyme, meaning that they, there's no conversion of minoxidil to its active metabolite, minoxidil sulfate, so they need a higher dose, but you don't know what your genetic profile is because I can't guess it unless I actually do a genetic analysis. So I do like that. It's not an absolute mandatory thing to do. I can absolutely do an empirical standard dose and see how things go. Um, there is a small cost with the genomic evaluation, but the genomic evaluation gives me a lot of accuracy 
uh, so that I can dose it. For example, if we go the topical route, not only is the percentage important, but this test also looks for other ancillary uh, ingredients to see if they are helpful in the mix. For example, tretinoin, flu, tre, tretinoin which is also known as retin-A, flucinolone, these things could help or hurt the, the absorption depending on your genetic makeup. This test also gives me information of vitamin deficiency. So for example, if you don't want to take Nutrafol, I can also look for exact what vitamin deficiency you have. And some women are very focused on vitamin deficiencies and they want to do that with their natural therapies and go for it. And I think that's not unreasonable because oftentimes vitamin issues can be a contributing factor. I'm a sort of, as a surgeon, I'm into big results. And I think vitamins are not necessarily going to blow up your whole head like my other therapies can. I'm using the vitamin therapies as more of a reduction of causative problems like vitamin deficiency could cause um, some of the hair loss, but I'm not, I'm not convinced that vitamin therapies alone will make a massive substantial difference in the scalp, at least right now in 2024. And you may hear a different video in 2025 uh, or even one in a few months. I'm constantly reevaluating everything, but this is based on 20 plus years of history as being a hair surgeon and focused on these therapies. As you probably know, I've written nine textbooks on hair transplants. So this is something I'm very focused on is developing uh, uh, protocols that I think are very effective for women. Unfortunately, a lot of the therapies I've developed are proprietary and original, and most people don't offer these therapies that I'm talking about. Um, so, the, so that is sort of um, my mix of therapies of when I go to biochemical. What's, let's talk about surgical indications. So my uh, colleague in Saudi Arabia did a study where he found that a lot of women have miniaturization in their donor hair, which basically means that the hair is undergoing a process of, of hair loss even in the donor capacity. And he found that in 1,000 women, there was a huge percentage. I don't remember the percent. But he argues that because of that, we should not do a transplant in women. What's interesting for me is I've transplanted women with this uh, uh, thinning of their donor and they maintain and sustain a wonderful result for a long time. I think the reason for this is that they have a uh, less of a testosterone drive toward hair loss if they're not on testosterone replacement and they do quite well with this situation. So the pattern that's in the in the donor area that's considered dangerous that my colleagues alluding to is something called diffuse and pattern alopecia or DUPA. What this is is that the back side is thinning and miniaturizing like the top. Now, I'll be honest with you, I look at that all the time. And so if there's extensive miniaturization of the donor, yeah, I'm not going to be touching that donor. I'm not a fool in terms of looking back there and saying this is unstable, it's not good. I'm also looking at how the chronicity of that female hair loss is going. But if I find that that donor area is some a little bit of miniaturization, maybe 10, 20 percent, and overall they have good usable donor, then I'm still good to go with surgery. The other thing is a lot of times um, I've heard, like what I've also heard is, well, you know, women's donor is really bad. They just don't have wonderful donor capacity back there. And I will say that that's fine and I still get amazing results with it. And the reason is several fold. First of all, women don't have the option to shave their head. This is not Shane O'Connor days of the 80s. And so if, even if they get some level of density, we're gonna talk about strategies in a moment, they're quite happy with things. So even if the donor capacity is less and I can get them a pretty good result in a targeted fashion, they can be very happy, even if the donor capacity is on the lower end. Now that's not all the, always the case because if they have extensive loss here and horrible donor back here, no. Of course, this is the, the understanding of making that judgment and helping a woman understand the realistic expectations when it comes to surgery. So I always look at that area to make certain where things are, but I've noticed that in women, when there's some level of miniaturization or thinning in the donor area, that they still get quite long-term sustainable outcomes, and they're very happy for many, many years, if not the rest of their life, especially sometimes if I'm actually adding a little bit of medical therapy. And that's actually another indication that I may be adding uh, a biochemical therapy. If I see a extensive miniaturization, I'm worried that they need a biochemical blockade to make those graphs sustainable, then I may do that as well. But obviously, if it's just too miniaturized and the donor is poor, I may not be offering surgery for that female patient. And uh, on the converse side, if it's a male with DUPA, I'm not touching that person. The risk is way too high uh, for future problems. So it's very different from, for women versus men in terms of my opinion of donor capacity. Let's talk a little bit about strategies. Do I do FUT strip? Do I do FUE? 
in women, um, which one? So almost universally, I do FUT or strip in women. Now that's sort of funny because I just did a combination FUT, FUE on a woman this morning, but that was an, an exception. I'll talk about that in a moment. So why do I do FUT in women? And my uh, colleague in Saudi Arabia argues that he loves FUE, and he argues you can cherry pick those best graphs in the backside. And I didn't really want to counter his argument in front of him, uh, but I will counter it now. So I'm going to talk about the idea that with FUE, whether it's shaved or not shaved, you are actually reducing the total donor density of the backside of the scalp, and women hate that because if they thin out the whole zone with FUE, it can be much thinner. And if you cherry pick the best graphs off the backside, you're actually going to overtake a preponderance of those graphs and you're going to actually thin out the backside. So I think women, if they already have a more delicate donor area, and you're trying to take just the absolute best graphs on the backside with FUE, I think you're going to have more of a problem long term in terms of density, especially when you're trying to harvest it over a wide area with FUE. The other problem with FUE is that FUE is uh, also usually requires shaving. It doesn't always. If you do a long hair FUE, it can take up to two days of harvesting. I think that's just miserable as in terms of a, for me as a surgeon, but it's also miserable for the patient. And I think it's just not necessary. I think the strip or FUT procedure provides such great results and allows me to harvest multiple times. That's the other thing we don't think about, is that with FUE, when the more time you harvest off that backside, the more donor density loss you have in there, and you don't want that backside to be weaker, especially when women are complaining of putting a ponytail back there, I think it's a problem. And I don't leave bad scars, I don't leave a horrible scar. So there's a lot of advantages with FUT. There's no shaving the, the scalp at all, top, back, side and there is uh, a quick recovery. Now, the, the things that people argue against FUT is a painful procedure, painful recovery. These are false. The way that I do things is quite unique. So during the procedure, you are knocked out with conscious sedation. You don't feel anything. The lady this morning I just finished, she said she felt nothing. I said, yeah, that's normal. Um, it's very different from most places because they don't have an accredited surgical facility, so it can be quite painful elsewhere. Here, it's really, really easy. You don't feel anything. Um, and then the next day, I've invented a technique using dilute Botox, place a few channels in the back of the scalp, there's slight discomfort for about 15 seconds, and first of all, my majority of my patients have almost no pain. But when I add this little injection in there, the pain goes instantly away, any tightness goes away, any numbness actually starts improving. It is quite a miraculous thing. I've written about this in my textbooks and I've lectured on this, but I don't think about 99.9% .9 of surgeons still don't understand and still don't use it. And I've continued to modify this. So the pain during and after a strip is really almost non-existent uh, in my hands, not elsewhere, uh, but in, in my hands. So that's why I really, for all these reasons, I prefer it. Uh, you know, and the other thing is some people say, well, you don't need to shave the whole head. I just need to do a shave a window on the backside. And I think that's also problematic because if you take lower density on a whole big area, that's not as risky as I take a whole loss of, loss of density in one area. That's a problem because now that central zone becomes much weaker. Not to mention you got to sit for six months to a year with a window that you have to cover and let that grow back in. But the difference is when I take a centimeter strip out and I close it, there's no density gap. That, that area I can take a high concentration in one zone and close it. So there's so many reasons that a strip procedure is so, many, so much better. Now, this is an exception. This morning I told you I did a combination FUT and FUE procedure. The reason I did it, I did an Orthodox Jewish woman that likes to shave the back of the nape of her neck, and I was able to take those grafts from her uh, in a way that I, there's no way I could take a strip on that. And I would say, learning from this, I would probably, if women have really good nape neck areas that I can harvest gently from, and they need more grafts, yeah, I would be open to an FUE in that area, like as I did this morning. The reason for her it was so easy is that I don't shave the whole head. I just shave the very bottom of the nape area and just harvest down there. And women are not going to be missing some hair down the nape of the neck during the healing. And also they have a whole he head to cover it. So I would only do that in select cases. And most cases it's just not necessary. So with women, it's a very different strategy than men in terms of design. So with men, the goal is that I, pre I, I design something that will stand, the, uh, stand the, uh, the, the, the test of time, that I don't just transplant in one zone because I don't want it to be exposed over time. With women, I don't really worry about that they're going to go bald. What I worry about is using those grafts in the back of the scalp for maximal aesthetic impact, which means I've got to take those grafts and nail it for the frontal zone. And, it, and oftentimes, 
by taking those grafts and splintering them all over the front of the, front of the scalp, you just don't see enough visual density. And then you figure, hey, that's just not gonna be very favorable. So what I do today and what I've been doing, and I've lectured on this, I've written this in my textbooks, are, are what I call TL, reverse L, and dumbbell design. So I'm gonna to talk to you about what that means. So what is this T? So think of it as, as an upside down T. Here is the horizontal limb and here is the vertical limb. So that T is the, the frontal hairline central forelock, which is an area that can be weaker in women. And then if it, they, the, the vertical limb of that upside down T is the part of the hair part. So what you have to do with women oftentimes is find a hair part that would work well. Now that, again, this morning for a female, I just think, think about her is an exception. She's very, very bald and she just has a whole zone that's empty. So I just transplanted the whole central uh, zone, a big circle, and she really needed that. But for most women, they, they, they need a vi big visual impact. So I try to hit one hair part. I tell them, choose one hair part and let me get maximal impact on that hair part. So that's what I do. And so the L obviously is the hair part on this side and the reverse L is the hair part on the other side. So I tried to tell them, pick a hair part. Now, if I come back for a second session a year later and do more density, they may say, look doc, I really wanna do my central hair part, no problem. Uh, and that's where my second goal is. Or at least what I try to do with women, is I, or even men, I always write down priorities. So I look at what the maximal graph field I can pull. I don't charge per graph, by the way. I think it's a silly idea to charge per graph. I try to pull as many graphs as I can without damaging the donor. And I just want to get a result for you. So what I try to do is I transplant one part and I'll say, okay, if we have more graphs than I thought we would get and I've really covered what I want, can I what is your second, what's your next priority zone? So it may be your central hair part, or it could be the, the crown. So let's talk about that. And that's what I call the dumbbell design. So dumbbell is a stupid word. It's a word that I came up to describe this. I don't think anyone else uses this term, but a dumbbell is a circle, a circle, and a line, right? So if you think about the circle, circle, line, this, the front zone, which is also known as that sort of horizontal limb of these TLs, I, I, it can be a circle or a line, but it's this frontal zone. And then that central zone, let's say it's a central hair part, and the back side, the crown is the second part of that circle. So this dumbbell design is the idea that there is a frontal zone, a central hair part. Now that dumbbell line could be on one part or the other. It doesn't have to be in the middle, but it's easier to conceptualize when I talk about a dumbbell that it be, be in the center. And then the crown is that central area there. So when we deal with crowns in women, the goals are radically different from men. With men, the crown is usually a big bald circle that needs to, be, uh, needs to have hair in it. But with women, the crown is an area that really is very unique in the sense that it's really volume. Most women do not complain they have a bald crown. They say, I don't have enough lift back here. I don't have enough volume. Uh, I just came back from Korea a couple months ago in June and lectured on the crown. And I talked about men versus women in, in terms of their goals. The one thing I talk about with crowns is we oftentimes when we think about crowns, we think about the, a bald man, you, it's called the bleacher effect, where you sit behind that bald man, you look at him and you go, oh, he's got a big bald crown on the back side, a big hole. But with women, that's not the case because it's the same effect where I talk about men, which is that balding actually looks visible on the side view and the frontal view. So how does that, how is that possible? So from a side view, there's a flattening in a man or woman, typically a male, we're talking about right now for a moment, is that there's a sloping zone where it just looks bald. And then the, the front zone, because a lot of those hairs in the top half arch up over the front to create density, that can also create a visual loss from the frontal view. And if you want really detailed information about the crown, listen to some of the lectures I've I've uh, published on YouTube uh, where I go through my creative design of how I design a crown, but that really doesn't have the relevance for a woman, to be honest with you. Because with women, what they usually complain about is, I feel like I've lost density back here. And so what I do with women with that dumbbell is actually it's not two circles that are the same size. It's a big circle in the front and a tiny circle in the back. So I concentrate those graphs in the center of the crown to create visual lift. I make those, those recipient sites angled upwards so that I can create a really good lift of that zone so that the hair is splay open, fall back down because women usually in the crown are not complaining of I have a bald crown, although I have done that as well where it, even then I, it's still not bald but I hit, I hit a much bigger zone. Usually it's I've lost volume, Dr. Lamb. I don't like how it's flat it is. And that's when I do that modified dumbbell design and then some, but I sometimes don't have enough graphs to cover that. 
But that's when that priority comes back into play, which I mentioned, which is I may say, you know what, there is uh, more, uh, I, I, if I got the front and the hair part done, if I have more graphs, where would you want to go? Some women tell me, you know what, I really would love a little bit more on my left part right in, in this zone or a little bit to the left center. And a lot of women tell me, you know what, I want that crown done. If you have enough graphs, to, to, if you feel comfortable that you got that front done to your satisfaction, we'll do it. Or let's say it's the hair part and they'll say, you know, I like how you've done this center, but if you could just extend that center a little bit farther out, if you have the graphs, we can do it. And that's part of that negotiation that we discuss that sounds reasonable. Of course, I always overlay that with my consulting advice because I have a lot of visual knowledge of, and experience with hair that I can tell you, hey, I would really recommend priority two be this. And if you said, no, I don't want that, then no problem. And I always circle and have you sign off on the pre-op day that this is what we agreed to so that we don't have any misunderstandings when we approach the day of the procedure. So those are um, some basic concepts there. The, uh, the final thing, I'm, I'm not really going through the exact details of the, the strip procedure, the surgery. It's just, it's a lot of information. We're, we're, we're basically at over 30 minutes of discussions, but I just wanna talk about one more point. I've got um, some of my older videos on female hair loss. I'm sorry, you have to wade through that if you wanna hear about the nature of the surgical procedure, the surgery, um, uh, or the recovery, and it, it's actually quite easy. But I want to just touch upon one more major, major topic that that is very particular for women, which is what's called postoperative shock loss or telogen effluvium. So women are very susceptible to temporary shock loss. They can have it in the front in the recipient site. They can have it in the donor area. Um, I'm doing some major studies on this right now, uh, undergoing literally. It's happening right now to, to look at this in a double-blind fashion, but it is something that really is tragic. Women hate this, and it's a temporary phenomenon, but women get a lot thinner after a transplant for a few months, and that could be very devastating. They have to wear a wig in the worst-case scenario, which I, I rarely see that, but it can happen. So a few things I want to talk to you about in terms of preventing, and I want to be careful preventing. It's more like minimizing the risk and also how to address it if it occurs. So my Folly Flow product, again, I have a COI on that, but I love this product, um, is, is really effective. And so now with women, I used to use minoxidil as a preventive. I no longer use minoxidil because minoxidil to me causes more problems of secondary hair growth. It causes itchiness. It, it, as it causes more uh, is, issues of instability in terms of shedding before growth. And then it grows too much hair. I can't read what's going on with this. It take, and, and then when they pull, you stop it, it actually starts to shed more. Um, there's just so many fraught, so many things fraught with problems if, if you are using minoxidil as a temporary uh, treatment to manage hair shedding around the time of the surgery. So what I prefer to use is Folly Flow. So the way I do it is I start as soon as possible. So if you come in for consultation and you're not knowing when surgery is going to come, I just say start using it. But ideally you're using it for a few weeks, maybe a month or two before the surgery and maybe a month or two after the surgery. I usually stop a couple nights before because I'm using a chlorhexidine for my patients the night before. I restart a few days after. When do I restart? So I use an ATP spray to help with graft growth. I always tell my patients so they're not over confused and not to dilute any of the products out. Drain your ATP and then you can start your uh, folly flow again. There's really no contraindication to start it earlier but that's my usual window for my patients. Again, this would be different for, for your doctor and I don't want you to be using your product if your doctor is not sanctioning it. But in my opinion, the Folly Flow works extremely well to manage shock loss uh, if it occurs and also as a, as a mitigation uh, way to sort of minimize that risk. But the way that I, um, I manage, the, um, I manage the, 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 the shock loss, prevent the sh or minimize shock losses, I don't just do the recipient, I do the entire backside. I tell the patients to spray this twice a day leading up to the surgery and afterwards, even into the donor area. Sometimes I see some shock loss around the area that I harvested, so I want to minimize that risk. And it can actually bring the shocked hair back faster if you're using the Folly Flow. Uh, much, much faster than minoxidil and much and without the risk of shedding or other side effects to that area. So Folly Flow is my go-to around the time of the procedure in terms of minimizing shock loss. And if people love it, just keep using it. If you don't love it, then just use it around the time of the procedure in order to minimize that shock loss. The final thing I would talk to you about is a, st a hairstyle technique that can further minimize coverage of this area. So for example, let's say I did your 
hair, central hair part. Okay, that's what I designed, and you're thinning a lot in this area for the first couple months after this transplant. Well, you can take your hair from your left and comb it this way. You can right cover this way. You can take both to cover the center and make a, a hairstyle off of that. So you can actually cover sometimes, not always, but you can sometimes cover the area of deficit by creative hairstyling. The one thing I would caution you is that hair fibers, aggressive hair fibers, first of all, I don't allow hair fibers for at least two weeks until after the surgery. But the second thing that's important is I really, really don't love hair fibers after a procedure because the problem with hair fibers, they can kill the grafts if you're aggressive and how you, you, you stick the, the, the hair fibers on there. So I would be very, very cautious with that. Um, other things to know, that's most of the stuff I could, <laughs> I could speak for hours on this subject. Uh, I think you guys heard enough from me. Uh, I really did a, a, a flyby on all the, the critical components. I really haven't gone through every nuance of what to know with surgery. I haven't gone through the entire history of everything you need to know about how to uh, work up a hair loss in a female patient. I haven't talked about ruling out scarring alopecias like FFA or frontal fibrosing alopecias or CCCA or LPP or other weird conditions. It's just absolutely too much to digest in a single video. But I think if I went through this in a shorter fashion and didn't cover these massive elements that I need to talk about with medicine and surgery, et cetera, then I think, um, it, it, I think I'm doing you a disservice in, in terms of this video. Oh, I wanted to say one more thing just came to my mind is that um, I have a very low threshold to jump in and do surgery on a female, whereas I have a very high threshold to jump in and do surgery on a male. For men, I'm always worried about doing a transplant and having that exposed over time. And so the younger men, especially unstable men, I'm very un uncomfortable with. But for women, as a general principle, I'm very quick to jump in to do surgery if I think they have the right everything ready to go. So what are the things that I'm looking for? Essentially, there's no short-term hair shedding issues. It's, it's just a long-term chronic thinning. And if they meet that historical, val that historical uh, component and they don't have other weird stuff like a, an untreated FFA, CCCA, or, or some other weird condition, or they're not, as I said, going through massive hair shedding, that's already one checkbox, and the second checkbox is physical. Do they have decent enough donor and a decent enough uh, ability for me to work an area that's gonna be awesome for them, whether it takes one or two sessions or three sessions, are they willing to do that? Then the answer for me is usually a, a, is a very strong yes to, to move forward with surgery at a much faster clip. So if you come in for a consultation and I tell you basically, hey, you're good to go for surgery is not because I'm selling you a surgery. I really believe that it's a good option for you. Whereas a lot of times I turn about 30, 40% of my male patients away and I probably turn a fewer percentage of my female patients away for surgery because of the reasons I've enumerated. So hopefully this video gives you a good idea of how I approach women both medically and surgically.